Thank you, yeah, let's do it. Hello, can you guys hear me? All right, thanks so much. So I'm Dr. Shadi Rafich. Um, thanks for attending the uh, Hi Vitra talk. So I'm a board certified surgeon and the owner of Vet Triage. I want to make this as practical and clinical as possible. So um, a lot of the minutia, so the academic information will be in the proceedings for you, if you want to reference any of that, this hopefully will be a bit more useful to you in the real life setting. Just as a, a show of hands, if you don't mind, how many folks here cut pyometras at their practice? Yeah, perfect. Great, great, good. Um, so, a little bit about me, I graduated from Cornell in 06. I became board certified in surgery, went around the country uh, working at different facilities, running departments, owned a hospital, and now I perform virtual care full time with a triage. We're going to go through a bunch of information regarding PIOs. Again, I want to stick to the more practical clinical stuff that you can use. At any point, you have any questions or something seems unclear, feel free, ask. Oh, and by the way, if you're trying to get the credit for the course, I think the scanner is in the back, just so you know. Um, so we'll go through the incidence of pyometra, signalment, pathophys, bacteria, systemic changes, symptoms, all of your testing, and of course, surgery. And like I said, at any point in time, if you have any questions, please let me know. Um, over the past several years, with the literature for Pyometra, they've been they've changed the name to a, this complex cystic endometrial hyperplasia Pyometra complex. And the idea behind that is to show sort of the process, the hormonal process by which these dogs develop Pyometra. And because you can't necessarily tell all the time clinically at what stage during this uh, progression the dog, the affected dog is, they are coining this term now. So that's the newest thing for now. Uh, it makes sense in terms of the pathophysiology. Practically, it probably doesn't change much. A pile is a pile. But uh, we do have on occasion those, you know, mucometras or hydrometras, one that are not as bad as a pile, uh, whether it's clinically or in surgery. But um, this is the complex that we're calling these now. It's very common, of course. Um, it can be any age. It ranges from six months to 18 years of literature, but most of them are kind of middle-aged, uh, middle-aged older dogs, and uh, it'll affect 19 percent of all intact females. And just a picture here of the of the anatomy. Of course, you know, at the end of the day, it's a glorified spay, but there's a lot to talk about in terms of its systemic effects. So, middle-aged to older, um, they typically had their last heat within eight weeks. Um, I typically see the same thing with my history taking. Four to eight weeks prior to presentation, they had their, their last heat, and that's due to their hormonal changes. Um, most of the affected animals, intact females, have never uh, had a litter. So the, there's some maybe protective factor with, um, with moliparis and primiparis females. But regardless, this is, especially when, in my history where I've, I've Train plenty of interns and residents. The history is so important. It's not just a few PD and they're sick, but I, I you know, to make sure that they're intact. And then, of course, one was the last heat. It's really big to help kind of give you the clues, especially if you're a younger doctor just trying to get the trying to get the ball rolling. So there's, despite how common this is and how obvious the solution to this problem is, it's multifactorial in terms of what we think causes it. Um, Usually, typically, it's a hormonal disease at its foundation, and that sets up the uterine changes that that predispose that dog to infection. That's the, the main the main argument here. There have been, there are papers that look at dietary and genetic factors to this. Obviously, they had a, a difficult pregnancy. There's retained tissues or or fetuses that's going to make them more predisposed to having infection in the uterus. But by far, hormonal influence is the biggest. 
And so that's the cause for these, for these pets. I don't really describe hybridas in this way, although if you're going to describe them appropriately, you can break them into different types. So uh, this is sort of a progression, although there can be some overlap between the types, but it's supposed to be more about the progression. So type one, they have cystic endometrial hyperplasia. Type two, you've got progesterone influences and so cervix relaxes. Type three, plasma cells infiltrate the myometrium, and then that's when you have clinical signs. Then type four, you've got either open or closed chronic endometritis, and then A and B subtypes, A is open, B is closed. We see open more often than closed in dogs, but you, you, you theoretically could characterize your high metric case with a type, so you know, your three B or something like that. Just mentioning this because that's how it is in the literature as of now, but I'm not sure anybody really uses this type of characterization, nor does it really matter probably, but just so you're aware of it. And then and in any dog, whether it's a high mitra, or cat, but um, it, that have a, some sort of systemic inflammatory disease process. You know, a chart like this kind of helps characterize SIRS and, uh, and, and, and dogs, cats, and compare it to people. And these are just parameters to determine whether or not there's systemic uh, effect from the primary pathology. Again, whether it plays a role in their decision making or, or not, uh, I don't know, but SIRS does play a role in prognosis, and so it's something that's worthy of, of mentioning. So what happens? Bacterial infection in the uterus, okay. Um, e. coli actually is a normal flora in, um, in the vaginal and uterine uh, tract for dogs, but it's also the number one most common bacterial infection that causes pyometra. In fact, if you have a multibacterial infection, so let's say you culture the pus in the pyometra, if there's more than one bacteria, one of them is gonna be E. coli, 100% of the time. So, um, E. coli is the main, the, main, the main culprit here, but there are different bacteria that are reported in the literature, uh, gram negative, gram positive, and so that's just for you to be aware of. If I have a case of pyometra and the client uh, is up for whatever financially, I do culture them. I do culture them. And uh, they're going to have antibiotics anyway, but if you have a culture, you can fine tune those antibiotics more. Um, and it's kind of a bonus diagnostic. It's not required, of course, and it's a choice between performing a culture and saving a dog's life, you know, or saving a dog's life, or kind of saving a dog's life, and get rid of the culture. But, you know, it's just something to think about with, uh, with diagnostics. Typically with biopsy, by the way, I do offer the clients biopsy, the uterus and both ovaries. Um, again, if you have the finance to do it, why not? You're ruling out anything else, neoplasia. You're ruling out other diseases that are not pyo, uh, pyometra or that may be predisposed to patients with pyometra that might affect long term prognosis. Again, the luxury item is nice to have it um, if the pet owner has the finances for it. It's not required. Especially if they're older. And especially if I do see questionable lesions. If I do palpate like a, a urine mass or there's an ovarian mass or something, I'm going to push for a biopsy more. But I do offer that even if it's a standard pyometra. So here are all the reasons why the bacteria are nasty, the E. coli. They have all these different characteristics to them that, that causes illness in dogs. And um, this is just a slide to show that the, uh, it's a multi-systemic disease. You shouldn't think of pyometria as just being a uterine disease. Liver, kidneys are affected. So let's say, for example, you know, I have a patient that's got pyometria and they're atemic on blood work before surgery. If I'm able to get away with diuresing that patient, having my antibiotics and fluids for 12 to 24 hours preoperatively, then I will, if they're stable enough to do that. Um, you're monitoring for renal changes after surgery anyway because of the toxins from the bacteria. And so if I have the opportunity to, to treat that azotemia preoperatively, then I'd like to. Obviously, the, the pet comes first, not the numbers. And so if the patient's really ill and I got the uterus out, then I'm not really going to focus on diuresing them before surgery. But because of the systemic effects of high mitra, if you have the opportunity for a stable patient to diurese them beforehand, and then what I'll do is they'll, they'll be on fluids the night before surgery, antibiotics, the next day, every check renal values, hopefully improved or resolved, and then into surgery. 
Again, luxury item, if it's appropriate. Again, we all know, you get rid of the infection, the pets tend to get better. So I don't want to sacrifice anesthetic timing for this, but the point is that you have renal values that are effect, that are uh, elevated on the blood work. So if you can treat them beforehand, treat them beforehand. So these are all the kidney changes that can occur because of the, of the bacterial infection. Clinical signs, of course, they you know, vary. It's a sick dog, so your standard the vomiting, diarrhea, lethargy, anorexia. Uh, but of course, they've got PUPD as well. Typically, they had a heat cycle about a month or two beforehand. And you can see swollen glands, you can see the vaginal discharge, all typical of a, of a pyometra. Obviously, again, the intact females. I have questioned pet owners as to the quality of the spay. So let's see what happens to a female. She's been spayed, she shows all the signs of pyometra clinically, and then maybe even on diagnostics, you'll see some sort of a you know, soft tissue swelling, let's say, in the caudal abdomen. It looks like it gets dumped high up. Um, I question them. You, know, you have the server report from when it happened. And if you question these people, a lot of times they'll say, oh, I got this dog, I rescued him from like Taiwan or something, or I got him from Craigslist. She was spayed before I got her. Or, I don't have the server reports. Or I've seen server reports where you know, it says uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the left, left uh, ovary uh, couldn't be found or something. Like weird stuff, you know, weird reports. Um, and you go in there and it's just, you know, either a botched surgery or they, I don't know, something malicious, you know, I, I've had it happen before. Or it's truly a stump pile where there's, you know, uterine stump, but there's ovarian remnant syndrome, you know? And so questioning the pet owner on the quality of the spay and seeing the survey report can matter a lot too. We've got one of these tricky ones where it's like, boy, this really does seem like a pile, but she's spayed, you know? So just keep that in mind too. Ovarian remnant syndrome is, uh, it, it's difficult, especially if you have a look. Because are always a large breed dogs. That's, those are the ones that get the ovary, ovaries left behind. Those are difficult spays, you know, 100 pound Bernese or something. Um, so to try and find that ovarian remnants can be difficult, but you can do it. You can do it. It's just a matter of just making sure you're prepared for a large amount of exploratory with all the equipment involved with that. We can talk about that if you, if, if, if you have cases like this. Standard radiographs before surgery, um, you know, descended. Descended uh, um, dental tract, and then you know if you if you need a, a ultrasound to confirm it. Uh, as an intern, I would call it level bubble. You know that I was, I was looking for a bladder, and then there was another fluidal structure next to the bladder. I was like, ah, pyometra, got it. You know that wasn't confident enough that the radiograph to interpret it. But most of us can diagnose it from history and physical exam, and the radiographs just sort of confirm it, and then you're you're going to surgery. You, know, you don't need an ultrasound, but it's it's it's. Hopefully, if it's ended enough, um, fairly easy on ultrasound to, uh, to diagnose it. Now, we're going to talk about you know, medical treatment a little bit, and the proceedings go into great detail about medical management. Uh, I'll make it very clear, of course, it's a surgical condition. Um, the only reason why I even have medical management in here is because it's in the literature everywhere. And you, know, you could argue, and I'll show you examples of why, you could argue that some patients maybe are more amenable to medical management. But hands down, regardless of those reasons, this is a surgical condition. Uh, it's curative with a spay, assuming they don't have a uterine tumor or something. It's curative. Spay, spay her, and we're, we're done with it. But because it's in the literature, we're not going to go into excruciating detail. All the details are in the proceedings. If you don't have them, you will. But uh, I have to mention them. So the, the, these are the different categories for medical management, and what medications you can put them on and try and treat them. And of course, surgery is a, is a spay. So reasons for medical treatment of a pyometra, again, it's a surgical condition, surgery is the way to go. But if they are a valued uh, breeding bitch, if uh, she's otherwise healthy and young, she has an open pile and normal kidneys, the combination of these, of these factors, you could argue for medical management. I don't have any personal experience with it. Again, all my information is from the notes from the medical literature rather. I uh, went through many years of it to, to compile that data for you. But this is essentially what you're looking for in terms of a candidate for medical management for pyometra. Not recommended, but if you were going to recommend it, this would be the combination of, of factors to recommend those, those pets. Um, these are other reasons that you might recommend medical management. You know, maybe the owner can't afford it, maybe the pet can't handle anesthesia. 
maybe the owner just prefers medical management, um, or maybe you're using it as preoperative stabilization, which to some degree I always am because they're going to be on fluids and antibiotics and stuff. So, you know, sure, but uh, in terms of long term medical management as a resolution for pyometra, these might be other factors you can consider. And again, it's preferred that they're open pyos. You know, a closed pyo is hard sell for medical management. Um, here are issues that you can have with medical management. So we decided to go that route. We need to have clear client communication as to what can go, could go wrong. This is, of course, self evident to anybody who's, who's uh, experienced in the field. Peritonitis, being febrile, hypothermic, closed cervix. The closed the cervix can close up on you and have concurrent diseases. These are all reasons either things that can go wrong with medical management or reasons to not have medical management of a pet. Um, I mean, you don't want to get to this, this point where they're, they're this sick, you know, so this is why you cut them. And, um, and, and, and if, you're, if you're looking for concurrent or variant or neuro diseases, you know, I'm not really sure to be that obvious on radiographs. You kind of need an ultrasound or, or higher, but you need something else to figure this out. So anyway, uh, surgical disease. Here are the success rates and uh, for medical management, it divides success rate to the response for pyometra, as well as what the chance you can still breed her, and then what the chance that you can come back. And so this is a synopsis from literature, and it's going to be all, all in the notes as well. Complications from it, you know, we went through it. There's a, yeah, anyway. So you say it's a surgery. The surgery is the gold standard that's been looking for the, with these cases. And again, to glorify today, um, you want to stabilize as much as possible. We won't go into too much detail about stabilization as a whole different talk, and I'm always fortunate enough to have like ER doctors around and criticalists around who can do, who can really help with the really bad ones, but you're trying to manage the, the septic patient, uh, fluids, uh, uh, colloids, monitoring, all the cardiovascular parameters, getting the stable can for surgery. If you have the luxury of stabilizing their parameters before cutting them, it's great. Usually I'm being called in the middle of the night to do these, so I come in, cut them, and the goal again, get rid of the infection. Just get the infection out of them, and the body will hopefully bounce back. That's the idea. And if you've done lots of spays, if you've done lots of pyometras, it's a, it's a standard spay at that point. So hopefully a pretty quick surgery, you know, 30 minutes or less, you know, depending on, on your, your skill set, when you have available too far, the system still is, and things like that. Um, there are lots of different techniques for spaying a pet, and so it's not, like every single one of these techniques are viable for pyometra. I I don't perform any any laparoscopy, but I, I don't know anybody who would cut a pyo with a scope. Um, I don't know if that's possible. Uh, you know, huge descended infection in the uterus. I'm not really sure it's an obvious you know, an option, but I want to be thorough just for the sake of the discussion to say, hey, look, there's lots of different ways you can perform a spay. Doesn't mean it's great for a pyo, but this is the, these are many different ways, and it's it, it, you know it's in more detail. If anybody hasn't seen a, a laparoscopic image, this is a this is a ovary here, very pedicle, the laparoscopic tool going in to clamp clamp off that pedicle. Um, again, I don't have maybe been involved with two of these. I'm doing the standard procedure, a uh, a ventral midline incision is what I'm what I'm doing for space in general, but especially for high matrix. And this is what you expect to see. It can vary in size. Usually, it has some huge fluid or uh, pus filled uh, uterus. It's friable tissue, thin walls. I've had I've had these rupture on me. That sucks. It just it adds so much time to anesthesia. It's avoidable. Just be very gentle in manipulating the uterus, the uterine body and horns. But you can have you know a, 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 a something that doesn't really look that bad in surgery. Um, and I've had them come back on biopsy at mucometrics, hydrometrics, etc. But uh, it doesn't matter. You know, it's, a lot of times, even with the smaller ones, you still look very insist. So you know, you know, there's a hormonal component to this, obviously, and that's it. They spay them, and, and it should be uh, cured from there. A couple of uh, pointers that I'll go into. Number one, even in big dog space, right? If, if you guys actually, yeah, show of hands, when you're performing a large dog stay, uh, are you do you have an assistant in there, or do you balance the retractor? So how do people have an assistant with you? For a spay or a large dog spay. How about how about self-retaining Balfour retractors? Yeah, so you're, so you're all in there alone with no attraction, right? For a large dog spay. Yeah, and so it, 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 it's part of the reason why I see a lot of GPs fearful of large dog spays, whether they're in here or not. Doesn't even matter to me. It's more just the size of them, freaks some beds out, 
And I would say if you want to use your time, either have an assistant scrubber with you to retract things for you, or invest in a, in a self retaining valve port retractor. It's phenomenal. It keeps the abdomen open for you. It makes the surgery that is probably already easy for you even easier. Um, or at least you'll know that you, that you, you can see all the ovarian tissue that you're removing with a, with a valve port retractor. So for pyometra especially, because these are huge, uh, these can be really huge because it's a big dog, you want to have either an assistant with you or retractors. You don't need to. I mean, you know, obviously you can be done without that, but it makes the surgery easier for you if you can do a lot of these. The second thing I want to mention in terms of the surgery, this uterine stump. So if I show of hands, how many people here do anything special with the uterine stump with pyometras? Like you close it, you suture momentum on there, do anything with it? Or you, you sever it and that's... I used to do a Parker Curve over surgery. What did that I used a Parker Curve over surgery. Yep, to over sew it, yeah. Anybody else? That, I do the same thing. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I over sew it. Because you have, you have all this, it, it's, hard to, it's hard to get all that infected tissue sometimes going all the way down to the cervix. Um, and this whole thing is distended. You only go down so far in the pelvic canal, you know? So you end up removing the uh, uh, uterus and then at that cervix area, the before or after, depending on the anatomy of the dog, um, I'll, I'll, have, I'll, at least, I'll at least over sew it. And I'll actually suture omentum to it as well. If the omentum reaches that far, then I'll suture omentum to it. Uh, maybe two or three sutures just, you know, around. And uh, just if, if simple disrupted, just keep the omentum there. I mean, the omentum probably will go there anyway, but uh, it's nice to just suture it there and have it do its thing right away. So, uh, and, and if it's really bad, it's really thick and uh, pedicle, I'll close it like a stomach. I'll do a two layer closure. So a simple continuous pattern and then like an inverted pattern for it, and then omentum on it. So pedicles, it's a standard pedicle surgery. Um, in my eyes, if you're fortunate enough to have a full instrument like a ligature, very strong bipolar sealing uh, device, it's phenomenal for pedicles. And it only, it's, both, it's labeled for only seven millimeter diameter vessel or, or less. I've definitely extended that, but it's great. Uh, it, it makes it, it, it makes the surgery just so much easier. Especially if you're doing it alone, without, without an assistant, you know? But otherwise, you have standard you know, holders and sutures you can use, or you can go with, with a hemoclips, either this version where you put the staple in there yourself, or the automatic hemoclips. Um, the LTS, I'm not sure I've used this for pyos, even for spleens. But uh, anyway, anyway, it's a pedicle surgery, so whatever you feel is, is time effective for you, and you're comfortable using it, go for it. I, I, I definitely had, uh, times where something as cool as ligature, even with really, the really large jaws, I can't get through the uterine stump, and so I have to use a sharp, you know, a scalpel or, or a scissor to cut the uh, uterine pedicle, and then, then two layer, one or two layer closure for it. But if you do a lot of vascular surgery and and you can invest in one of these, it's well worth it. Um, I I I would do these for regular stays too. You know, it's great. It saves you so much time, and you don't have to suture the patient. If that matters, but anyway, some things that the things about. Otherwise, most people are, are performing the, the spades and pyos with the handheld, you know, with needle holders and suture. Now, these complications for surgery are for any spay. It, it doesn't pyo or not doesn't matter. But you know, spades are very commonly performed procedure, and and so there's lots of other strong complications of spades. So this is giving kind of a rundown. Again, this is not specific to pyos. It's just in general all the short-term and long-term possible effects of spades. It's not like you're necessarily going through every single complication with a pedal or a spay, it's fairly routine, you know, uh, but just be aware that things, things can happen. So, just for your information there. Now, because pyometra is so common, there's lots of literature on it, and there's lots of literature on mortality factors, and some of these factors in literature are hard to interpret. There's, there still depends on the study. It's with any other complex disease. It's hard to determine it. So it's hard to put it together into one, one in a consistent uh, fashion. But these are all the different mortality factors that can affect the patient's outcome long term. So you know, biomarkers like, like CRP are very common. They're very popular. They've been popular for years now. Looking to hey, can we figure out based on CRP levels the chances the patient will make it through, through surgery and anesthesia. The SIRS. 
parameters. That's why I mentioned it before. Those have been shown if you have SIRS or more likely to have a poor prognosis. Um, these are things that are, that are kind of, with any surgery really, you know, these are very, these are very common with, uh, with uh, any surgery of a critical patient. The absence of leukocytosis is interesting. So, you know, I'll have, again, you know, interns, they'll say something like, oh, but the white count isn't high. And, you know, the reason for that is, well, the white count's not in the blood. They're in the uterus, you know? And so it's all sequestered there. So you don't have to have leukocytosis. Um, but anyway, just, just, a, just a, for screening purposes, it, it's got all the other markers of high mitra, and then I have a high white count. That, that's okay. It doesn't mean it. It doesn't mean that it's not a high mitra. Overall mortality, 0 to 27%. Euthanasia rate. Uh, urine rupture. This is why rupture in the uterus is really, you really want to avoid it. It's not just because it makes a longer surgery, it's annoying, it's, it's, it's preventable, but it does affect mortality. This probably pertains to the literature with uterine rupture before you got in there. You know, it ruptured because of thin walls and, and, and compromise. But anyway, you don't want to rupture the uterus. I have yet to, you know, me or, 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 or know anybody who ruptured it on a physical exam, but they always say, like, be careful you can they, you know, you could rupture it. So, uh, I, I don't know, but uh, anyway, then, then, then the, um, obviously the mortality rate associated with closed piles would be higher with, the, with than an open course, right? They're usually sicker when they come in as, open, as, as closed piles. That's pretty, that's pretty, pretty typical. So just some key points, just to go over uh, everything here. We're trying to coin the, this term here. So is it going to be endometrial hyperplasia of hydrogen complex? We really well all the time. Um, there's a, another condition that's in your proceedings as well. It's called an endoplacental complex or something. Just another phrase. So there's one paper that I know that talks about this. It's, a, it's another phrase to describe a progression to being a pyo. I don't know how much more specific we can get with these, but I just want you to be aware of it's in the literature. But to me, you know, pyo is a pyo. You want to happen to have a, a heat cycle in the past eight weeks to kind of give you a hint that it's a pyometra. And that's what gives you their uh, the PUPD from the bacterial toxins. You should consider these pets all on some level of SIRS or sepsis. Again, the whole point is that it's a multi-systemic disease process, right? Um, even though the uterus is mingle, surgery is curative. Now, again, we went through like culture and biopsy to be some optional nice things to have. You know, three of you thoracic radiograph before surgery. You perform that with every single pile, probably not. Um, if, it's a, if it's a middle aged or older pet for that breed, should you recommend it? Maybe. You know, these are all, uh, these are all screening schools as a specialist, as a board of surgeon, I will talk to people about before surgery without any pressure. Again, it comes really down to finances. Do you have the finances to screen the dog for metastatic disease or not? Uh, most high are not cancer. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an offering, but it's not required. But anyway, I, I wanted to mention, mention that. And then factors to consider. So bowel forward factors, I think they're huge um, to help with surgeries like this. And if you perform any bowel surgery, you guys, you don't need to, it's not just for spades and pilots. Bowel fours are great, and I'm surprised how many GPs don't use them. But again, you may, you, may not, you may not need them. If you're super experienced, but they're comfortable without them, it's great. The, I think the biggest reason why I see uh, ovarian remnant syndrome is because of lack of exposure in the abdominal cavity, you know, even over it behind, it's a big dog especially if they're in heat and you didn't know it. Um, Post-op care, I can go into this a little bit. Um, obviously, a lot of you cut pilots, so um, I treat them like any other you know, critical patient with like chemoabdomen or a GDB or something. So I'm gonna monitor their um, ECGs post-op every six hours or continuous, so I have continuous, and then blood pressures every six hours. Again, more often than you need to. Um, and they're on fluids. And I tell pet owners, ideally, Ideally, they've gone fluids before surgery, they're azithemic. If they're not azithemic, or they don't have luxury, then they're going to be on fluids for at least 48 hours after surgery. And I'm going to check their renal values before they go home, either 24 or 48 hours after surgery, depending on how the case is doing. I want to make sure their kidneys aren't being hit by the E. coli, by those factors. So they, they, they get stabilized as much as possible before surgery. They're on fluids, at least one and a half maintenance. If they can handle it, you know, no heart murmur, heart disease, whatever. And they're on fluids until they go home. Um, I didn't check renal values one or two days post out to make sure they're okay. It, it turns out, of course, and probably not, not to your surprise, you know, a lot of these pyometers are, are money cases. 
they don't have the finances for this, right? They didn't see the dog for a reason, and now it's got a high out, and you know, it's had three accidental pregnancies in its life, or whatever, so it's a mess. And, so they don't have any money. And so you, you get her in, you spay her, she goes home the same day. You know, that's, I'm giving you kind of the gold standards, especially what I'm looking for. Uh, I recognize a lot of times dogs come in, like, they don't have money. And so you just you cut the dog, you get them home. And that's, and that, that handles it, it's fine. Um, especially as I, I, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna recommend the things that, that I, I want, but um, they don't have to do it. The goal is to get that uterus out. To, don't be fancy about it. But I want to make sure you're aware of it. So otherwise, we're talking about care, pain meds, antibiotics. Um, I guess you could make the argument that you know, the antibiotics, if you didn't enter the, the viscera and the infection is gone and they're doing great. I mean, I'm still going to put my antibiotics for 10 to 14 days post-op. Um, I know antibiotic usage is very, uh, um, uh, it's being challenged. I've been challenged for a good reason for antibiotic resistance, so you should judge me on that. But they're, they're probably going to go home with the Clavamox afterwards. I usually have my Unison injectable in the hospital or ampicillin if you have access to that. Um, concurrent mammary gland tumors. So I had ones, you know, and I'm sure you have too, where you diagnose, yeah, they've got mammary gland tumors, and again, you know, that's extra finances, of course, for the pet owner. Um, do you, you just remove the gland or you do a, a mastectomy, you know? Unilateral or bilateral, right? And it's anesthesia time. Can the pet handle more anesthesia time for mammary gland tumors? And so it's a conversation with the pet owner. You know, it's whatever you want to do. Um, luckily, most dogs, most high are dogs, and so most mammary gland tumors in dogs, you can probably handle by just removing the gland itself. If you are comfortable doing it, the pet can handle that anesthesia-wise, and the owner wants to pay for it. Because it's not just a surgery, you want to go submit the gland for biopsy, ideally, right? Um, and I tell the pet owner, if the pet is not doing well on anesthesia, I reserve the right to abandon the mastectomy, you know, because the priority is the PIO. So we can always remove mammary gland tumors later. It's not like the pyometra surgery is a neoplastic condition, so we can do surgery on this dog in the next few weeks or months or whatever for the mammary gland tumors. Um, or you do it at the same time, depending on your skill set and the owner's finances, what they want to do, and the pet's ability. So obviously, you know, the thought of these are also hormonally induced. So um, you want to take care of them at the same time if you can, otherwise in the future. But that's, that's also going to be a, a factor there. The goal is the plan that's the goal. And so prioritization, prioritization applying finances, I'm giving you kind of the Ivy Tower sort of spiel about this, but you know, again, the goal is get them in, cut them, get them out. That's, that's the ultimate goal. Okay, this is how you can reach me. If you have any questions at all, I'll be happy to address them. Yes? You know, you mentioned that you improved the dog's condition prior to the surgery. And we were talking yeah. So the question. It's it's so the question is you know what's the reasoning behind giving them antibiotics preoperatively if you're trying to stabilize them before surgery or you have the luxury of stabilizing them or uh, making them more um, anesthetic friendly before surgery what's that even antibiotics. And so the, the antibiotic I would use is Unison or ampicillin. Um, and um, I, I, well, most of the cases I've seen are open pios, so I haven't really had enough experience with clothes to, to make a conclusion whether or not they do worse or better um, uh, uh, open versus closed. Most of them are, are open. But um, uh, yeah, I'm, 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 if, I'm, if the patient is that bad off where there's multi-organ involvement, so kidneys, maybe liver, based on blood work, and I can stabilize them further, I'm going to hit them with antibiotics. Um, as far as I can tell, I have yet to see a problem with it, because I, yeah, yeah, because I haven't had any pets, I haven't had any of these dogs like crash and burn on me before surgery. If, if, uh, if they're stable enough beforehand, or they need some stabilization, but I have time to work with them, I haven't seen a problem with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, um, because I, I, am, I'm a, I'm a, I am a boarded surgeon, I typically am getting called in the middle of the night for these anyway, so they're not getting the fluids and, and a box beforehand. It's the ones that I'm seeing as like an appointment for, for as a surgery appointment, that I'm like, oh yeah, pyometra, let's, let's put her on fluids tonight, antibiotics, tomorrow we'll cut her, you know? Um, but yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen any, any detriment to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the idea is that if, you, if you're killing the gram-negative bacteria, 
with antibiotics, they're going to release endotoxin, which is the main, the main culprit in, in, in uh, hurting these dogs systemically. And if it's a closed pyometra, there's nowhere for that stuff to go. And so you're releasing all this endotoxin in the system, and there's nowhere for the dog to release it because it's a closed pyo. So uh, could they get sicker from the antibiotics? That's the idea. And I, I have yet to see it, but I also don't see that many closed anyway. Yes? Is good that the family Yeah, so the question is, um, um, on a referral basis, am I seeing any complications from these from these dogs that are being cut? You mean like post-operatively, somebody else cut them? Yeah, um, yeah I, um, I do not see that. If, if anything, leaving an instrument in there, <laughs> otherwise, <laughs> otherwise, no, I, I, I don't. I haven't had any word where they got cut that day by their, their family practitioner and went home and now they'll come to me in like acute renal failure or something. I, I, have, I haven't seen it. Or septic, you know, or whatever else. Um, or anything like a box surgery rather than like doing an instrument in there. Uh, I have not seen that be a problem. I'm trying to think. Uh, I have not seen that be an issue at all. Usually if I see them post off from like a general practitioner, it's for the mammary gland tumors. So they healed up from this, from this bay and now they need the glands removed and the doctor doesn't feel comfortable doing it. They don't know if it should be like a localized mastectomy, like a nodulectomy, or it should be a, a radical mastectomy, and then if it's, if it's, there's, if it's mammary gland tumors on both sides, do you cut both sides at the same time, do you do one then the other, you know, what's your logic behind all that? Because that's typically when I see them again. Um, or the mammary gland tumors were just either weren't there at the time of the pile, or they were missed on physical exam, and then the pet owner found them, and then I've them, seen them. But the success rate really is really good for these. Yes? The question is, do you, do you lavage um, or flush the, the stump when you're closing it? Or actually, in, that, in, that, in general, would you, would you flush these? Uh, I don't, unless there's evidence of uh, leakage from the surgery or from the disease itself. Like there's, like there's peritonitis, there's perineal effusion, or it ruptured, or there was ruptured when I got in there. Um, I, I'm not going to lavage them. You know, actually, to that point, so we just did a, a, a splenectomy talk before this. Um, I hadn't talked about lavage the abdomen. I don't lavage those either. I suction out the blood and make sure there's no blood in there, but I don't even lavage those um, because in those cases, they are anesthetically uh, compromised pets. I want them off the table. If they have a sarcoma, they have a sarcoma. Get them off the table. You know, I don't want to take even a few more minutes to flush the abdomen. The controlled splenectomy is scheduled fine. So pine choice, unless there's evidence for me to clear something out, I'm not flushing their abdomen. Uh, if everything's contained in the uterus, I'm not doing it. But also, again, um, I have luxury, I have valve retractors, or I have an assistant, I use both, and I've got lap sponges in there, and so everything's rolled off the rest of the organs, so all I have is uterus to play with. And then once I have a stump there, that's like a thickened, gross stump with crap coming out of it, it's still, it's laying on top of lap sponges, lap rotting sponges. So it's not contacting anything. So I can like lavage that locally, do my one or two layer closure, then lap sponges are out, so you throw to it, close up the belly. Locally, yeah. locally, the actual stump, yeah. yeah. It does, I don't know if it does much, because there's still so much crap in there, but uh, anyway. Yeah. You don't want to get like a focal abscess, you know, that obviously is. Other questions? Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you.